you've returned to Mandela County. Foolish. Nobody will find you. Nobody knows you are here. Nobody knows. Do you understand? Do you understand? 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 Do you understand? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where we understand, or at least we try to. And today, what we're trying to understand are the supernatural mysteries happening over in Mandela County, where children are going missing, humans are being replaced with doppelgangers, and a mysterious face keeps appearing on late night TV. Oh, it's so awful! Much better! Now, if you haven't seen our previous theory on the Mandela Catalog, an analog horror series here on YouTube, then I highly recommend that you start over there because this series is dense. Link is down in the description, or provided YouTube isn't stroking out, it should be over in that recommended feed next to the video. The overall gist is that the fictional Mandela County has been the epicenter of a rash of horrific and seemingly paranormal crimes over the past few decades. First and foremost, over 3,400 children have gone missing. Seemingly unrelated to that, a strange species of creature known as alternates have invaded with the ability to mimic humans. These things come in three different flavors. Type 1 alternates look like normal people and seem to have the ability to blend into regular society. Type 2 alternates have unrealistic proportions like long arms and stretched out faces, making them a lot more obvious to see, but also a lot more frightening. And Type 3 alternates are described as having biologically impossible characteristics, depicted by an upside-down figure. To my knowledge, we haven't seen any of these yet. At most, they've been censored, but on Honestly, I don't think I want to know what they actually look like. Regardless of the type, we've seen that alternates can be incredibly dangerous. They phase into reality, tell you something, and that little chat tends to infect the victim with MAD, short for Metaphysical Awareness Disorder, at which point you have like a 97% chance of self-destruction. It's not like they suddenly turn you into an electrode. I mean, death by your own hand, if you catch my brand-friendly drift. And if all of that wasn't enough, there's also a creepy face called the Intruder, who enters houses later night through any TV screens people might have hanging around. So really, Mandela County, just worst place to live. And that's largely where we left off last time. But at the top of this year, the Mandela Catalog Volume 2 dropped, a 20 minute upload that gives us a ton of world building, and a whole lot more to speculate about. Finding places for some puzzle pieces while putting more on the table. This time we're taking all the way back to the ancient and spooky year of 2009. <sighs> Oh, I'm starting to have flashbacks to that time that I watched G.I. Joe Rise of the Cobra and- I'll let you finish! But X-Men Origins Wolverine was the worst movie of 2009. And oh yeah, Kanye was shamelessly interrupting people. A terrifying year indeed. Volume 2 follows Adam Murray and Jonah Marshall, two members of the Bythorn Paranormal Society. It's worth noting that Bythorn was actually called out as one of the counties affected by child disappearances mentioned back in Season 1, and that being associated with this society is why these two are apparently wanted criminals. The two are contacted by a woman hoping the duo can investigate her house for spiritual evidence of a dead cat, which supposedly keeps her up with its haunting meowing at night. She specifically mentions that she doesn't think it's an alternate. Really? A freaking cat alternate? Shh. I don't think it's an alternate. They accept the job, and on their way over, we get some interesting world building. The fact that here in 2009, the existence of alternates is well known, but also hotly debated. Half of me thinks that there aren't even alternates. It's also clear that at this point in history, everyone knows about the existence of the intruder and have taken steps to try and prevent his invasion, with stuff like TV screens removed from all households. They didn't have to outlaw these things, did they? Like, I doubt that guy's face could appear on something like this and, you know, kill you. When they arrive at the house, unsurprisingly, some weird things start to happen. Curtains get moved, cameras go down, radios start malfunctioning. Oh my god, behind you! Dude, seriously, stop! Behind you! Behind you! <laughs> Adam is approached by an alternate and gets this truth bomb dropped on him. Yo, type 2 alternate be spitting some mad facts here! Okay, in all seriousness, you didn't miss anything. That was all gibberish. But it doesn't mean that that interaction wasn't important. What we just witnessed is them trying to infect Adam with mad. I'm guessing that what was whispered here was some metaphysical truth about humanity's place in the universe. Something that tends to make people lose their minds and end their lives. However, Adam is okay. He's still alive. Why? Well, as we learn about mad in an earlier upload, people only lose it when they don't want to 
to know the information. MAD is a result of exposure to verbal information that is not desired to be known. The subtitles even seem to allude to this in the immediate aftermath of Adam's encounter, saying, quote, it's not difficult to avoid. The patient must try to actively seek it out. This is also probably why Adam's been immune to the encounters he's had with alternates up to this point in his life. He wants the information. He's not scared by it. These things have taken so much away from us, yet you still run to them every chance you get. You're not invincible, okay? I know you thought that when we started doing these death marches. And nothing happened, and I get it, but this right here is real. Eventually, Adam makes his way down to the basement. On the wall are the words, nothing is worth the risk. This message is the same one that we saw given to emergency responders when they were told not to reveal their fears over the phone back in season one. Nothing is worth the risk, nothing is worth the risk, nothing is worth the risk. Again, we get this repeated theme of fear being the thing that puts you at risk, but Adam, by showing that he's not afraid, seems to be able to survive these encounters. He also finds a 4x3 television set. No Notable because in our timeline, those things were long out of style in 2009. This indicates that the TV has been kept here for a long time since the anti-intruder screen purge. Remember, in this universe, TVs are no longer a thing that are supposed to exist. On the TV is an image of a cat. The cat's meowing is replaced briefly by a music box style recording of Somewhere Over the Rainbow before the now familiar image of the intruder appears, front and center. When Adam asks the intruder what he is, the screen flashes to a series of images from season one, including the the Department of Temporal Phenomena splash screen, as well as images of Mark Heathcliff, a victim of the alternates back in 1992. When an otherworldly voice asks, What have you done? Adam responds, I did the right thing. Nobody is coming to help you. <laughs> Again, he's confident and unafraid of his actions. You'll notice that Adam's answer is immediately followed by a female voice. One that, if I were to guess, is Adam's lost female friend, sister, whatever it was he was looking for as hinted at earlier in the video. I wish we never looked for your because she is dead and gone and we were never gonna get her back. Meanwhile, Adam's friend Jonah drives away in terror, all while his GPS chides him in the voice used by the false angel from the season one upload Overthrown. <laughs> which makes it a good time to talk about the character names. This series is very clearly connected to biblical stories. There have been hidden Bible verses in the closed captions, there's been talk of angels and false shepherds, even the first image of the series is a corrupted clip from a video series called The Beginner's Bible. And here, we're watching the fallout of two biblically named characters, Jonah and Adam. Jonah, as most people vaguely know, is the guy that got swallowed by a fish in the Bible. What people might not know about that story is the reason he became fish food. You see, God sent Jonah to go tell a city that they were about to get wrecked unless they changed their sinful ways. Jonah chickens out and runs away, ultimately leaving the city to die. While on a boat trying to escape from the presence of the Lord, the sea gets real rough and won't calm down until Jonah is yeeted off the side and into the water, gulp, fish food. Now what do we have here in the Mandela catalog? Jonah refusing to stick with Adam, running away from the scene, and leaving his friend to die. And of course, there's Adam, first man, the one created by God in his likeness and who eats the apple of enlightenment, only to himself get yeeted out of the Garden of Eden. In fact, we explicitly see that exact scene from the Bible in this upload of the Mandela catalog. God's probably not even looking. Oh, go ahead. Suddenly, I feel kind of scared. Even though Adam ends this upload talking to the intruder, something tells me that we haven't seen the last of him. While we couldn't understand what gibberish the alternate was saying to him earlier, we do have this other conversation which begins to reveal a lot about the world. <laughs> This conversation seems extremely important for several reasons. First, it immediately shows us that this is a world that has two rival factions going head to head against each other. The Shepherd and whoever is speaking to us here. My guess is that it's the intruder, the guy ultimately on the TV screens. So it's a battle between the false Shepherd and his army of alternates, I'm guessing that's who we see in the first upload of the series, versus the intruder, who's kidnapping kids through their TV screens. You are either following one or the other. Great, really good options there, friends. So, which is right? Well, in order to understand that, we have to talk a bit more about Adam and the intruder. You see, I think the intruder might not be working against us in the long term. While the intruder does seem to be making children disappear, I suspect that he might be doing this to save the future of humanity. Future being the key word here. I want to focus on a detail that I've largely ignored thus far. The Department of Temporal Phenomena. We first see their logo at the very start of Volume 1. So, you know, this one's got to be important. But with a name like Temporal Phenomena, it seems to imply that there's some kind of time 
time travel at play. So why would a time travel department be handling the disappearance of children and the appearance of doppelganger alternates? Well, I believe the intruder knows who's gonna become alternates in the future, and he's trying to stop them before they become part of the unholy army that ends the world. Consider this. We know that this is a story full of biblical illusions, and in the canon of Catholic Church, anyone who ends their own life winds up in Satan's army, considering taking a life as a sin, and if you take your own life, there's no time for you to repent and be forgiven. This then leads me to believe that the alternates are working directly for the false shepherd, Satan. Notice that alternates don't kill you. They trick you into doing it yourself by giving you unwanted information and turning you mad. But by heading them off at the pass, the intruder is able to thin their numbers. In the video volume one, we follow the journey of Mark Heathcliff, a young man who, after trying to help his friend, is followed home by an alternate that keeps him trapped in his room. After a few days of being a prisoner, Mark ultimately winds up dead by his own hand. The false shepherd wins. However, the video also rewinds back to earlier in Mark's life, where we learn that he's been visited by the intruder since his childhood. The intruder also flashes images of Mark and his sister in front of the church when Adam asks who he is, which indicates that the intruder knew Mark and his sister when they were kids. Let's look back to what's said about Adam in this video. <laughs> wake up. It's almost like the intruder is taking kids and planting ideas in their heads so they're protected and unafraid of the alternates. Then, when the time comes, like sleeper agents, they're activated. That's why Adam's been so inexplicably obsessed with alternates. It's why he's been able to stay safe from their attacks. It's also, if I were to guess, what happened to his sister, friend, whatever, the girl that he's looking for. And that's why he's being told to wake up now. The intruder is asking, do you understand? In other words, do you understand that you're now being called into service? And what's more, if Adam can't do the job, there are others waiting to be awoken. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that the intruder is the good guy. He still seems to be taking children away from their parents. But regardless, I do think that the intruder is specifically working against the alternates, trying to starve them by culling their food source. By doing something unspeakably evil, he's doing his best to prevent a global catastrophe that happens in the future. So, there you have it. The uplifting tale of the Mandela Catalog. A story of religion, time travel, and old Sony cameras. Like I said, I get the sense that we haven't seen the last of Adam in this story, but we can all take away this lesson. The next time a creepy Edvard Munch looking character decides to be a real close talker to you and starts whispering into your ear, just be excited to learn that humanity is a mere pimple on the face of existence. Otherwise, things might not end too well for you. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.